Hello and welcome to another tutorial from Sot and Brain Hub. This one is going to cover the basics of the brainstem but also give you a couple of uh, tips and tricks to recognise uh, brainstem dysfunction clinically, particularly with uh, something like stroke for example. First of all let's look at this diagram. We have an anterior view of the brainstem and uh, the brainstem of course is made up of the midbrain and the pons and the medulla and we can very quickly draw on just a few key landmarks of each. In here we have the pyramids of the medulla, in here we have the olives of the medulla. Moving up into the pons now we have the middle cerebellar peduncle, the attachment of the pons to the cerebellum, of course that's posterior. Up here we have the cerebral crus and just on top we can just about see that's the mammary body, it's not really part of the midbrain but still visible. And uh, they're the main external features of the anterior brainstem. On the right hand side, I've drawn a very crude diagram representing each of those areas. So over here we would have that represents the midbrain, this represents the pons, and this mid the medulla. And what I've, the way I like to think about functions of the brainstem is to break them down into really three key major roles. And these are the things you should look for when considering whether a stroke, for example, has affected the brainstem. First of all, we need to think about its conduit functions. Conduit functions, and I mean tracts. So remember that every tract needs to pass through the brainstem pretty much coming from the, uh, from the body or trunk or to the body and trunk, the corticospinal tract, which is voluntary motor control, would travel from the cortex down and uh, through the brainstem and eventually to the limbs. Sensory information coming in has to run through the, uh, the brainstem eventually to make its way to the thalamus and cortex. The other thing that the cranial nerve has a lot of is nuclei and there's a lot of nuclei there but the ones I'm talking about here are cranial nerve nuclei. So let's think about the cranial nerve nuclei. Lots of them exist throughout the brainstem. In the midbrain, just as an example, we have the ocular motor nerve and the trochlea. And in the pons, we have facial and trigeminal, and in the medulla, we have vagus and vestibular cochlea. So these uh, cranial nerves, nuclei, are positioned within the brainstem. So whenever we see cranial nerve dysfunction, we might want to consider whether the brainstem is involved. Likewise, if we see problems with paralysis or sensory loss, we might think that the brainstem is involved. The other thing is integrative functions, and there's two things going on here. One is physiological centres. Physiological centres meaning centres in the pons, uh, in the medulla for example, that control cardiac uh, rate and rhythm and respiratory control and vomiting centres. So there's, there's those physiological centres, but also included in there is this uh, blue oblong that I've drawn. And this really represents a structure called the reticular formation. And when we think of the reticular formation, it's, I mean, it's a very poorly defined structure anatomically. You'll always see it drawn uh, schematically in diagrams. It's not something you can really see on the specimens themselves. But when you think of the reticular formation, think of consciousness. And we always think that when there's a problem with the brainstem, you know, the worst possible scenario, there is coma and uh, depreciating levels of consciousness on the spectrum. We should always think about uh, about consciousness when the brainstem is, is involved. So should we have a, co a, a combination of symptoms that involves tracts, that involves cranial nerves, or it involves integrated functions? We should think possibly the brainstem is involved. Now it may be that there's been a stroke or there's been an interruption to the posterior circulation, or it might be that there's, uh, there's herniation onto the brainstem from a problem elsewhere in the brain. So it doesn't mean that it localizes the, the issue, but it does mean that the brainstem has been involved. So one of the things that I think is, uh, is quite good to remember here is pulling two of, th two of these things together, um, which is a, a symptom known as alternating hemiplegia. And if we have alternating hemiplegia, it tends to infer that there's a, a brainstem problem. But what is it? Alternating hemiplegia comes from the idea that if we have cranial nerve problems, the cranial nerve problems will be ipsilateral. So let's take an example here. We'll say the hypoglossal nerve has been involved. The left hypoglossal nucleus is involved, but combined with that, we have contralateral, 
corticospinal tract sign. So the CN issue is ipsilateral and the contralateral is long tract signs. So should we have a problem where we say the left hypoglossal nerve is involved, but yet the right side of the body is, uh, we have hemiplegia, that would be uh, a type of alternating hemiplegia. And when we see that, so we see cranial nerve dysfunction on one side, but on the other side we see problems with the corticospinal tract, that is referred to as alternating hemiplegia and often a telltale sign that the brainstem has been involved, together of course with issues surrounding consciousness or issues surrounding integrative functions. But that's one thing to remember, alternating hemiplegia will infer brainstem problems. Now I'm going to move on now and just talk about some more anatomy because uh, often I get asked a lot about whether it's really important to know different cross sections through the brainstem. I think the days have gone where students need to know a, you know, the cross section of the medulla or the rostral, cordial, or midsection or through the pons. But I do think that the midbrain is quite an important structure because it reveals a number of uh, structures which are important for other diseases. What I've done here is shown you a cross section through the midbrain at the level of the superior colliculus. The superior colliculus is this structure sticking out the back here. And I've shown some nuclei on there which represent something known as the pretectal nucleus. Now that's really important in uh, the visual pathway, particularly in the, uh, the, the light reflex. Um, and we'll, we'll say no more about that at this moment. So the area outlined by gray around that black nuclei is the, uh, is this the superior colliculus. In the middle here we have the cerebral aqueduct, that's for the traveling uh, CSF. And around that we have something known as the periaqueductal gray, so that's important for uh, understanding pain modulation. The two structures in here, both in red and yellow, equal two cranial nerve nuclei. One is the oculomotor nucleus, and the other is the Eddinger Westphal nucleus. And uh, they're, of course, uh, really important uh, nuclei. Coming more anteriorly, we have the red nucleus, and more anteriorly still, really important structure, substantia nigra, uh, which is important, of course, for understanding Parkinson's disease. And right at the very front, this is the cerebral cruce, and this is uh, a cerebral cruce, put it on the other side as well. And this is where we would expect to find the descending corticospinal tract fibers. Okay, so I think this is the most important cross-section, really the only cross-section that I think is worth studying in detail, is a cross-section through the midbrain at the level of the superior colliculus and being able to identify these structures. Okay, that's it from me. See you soon. Subscribe to Sultan Brain Hub for more videos to help explain the mysteries of the brain.